Well, greetings to you again in the wonderful name of Jesus. Uh, I want to dive straight into this session and uh, deal with with prayer. And as you know, we are continuing to pray every day at 6 p.m. And if you are available, you're welcome to join us. Um, some of us are praying for half an hour. Some of us are going longer. But you're welcome to synchronize your prayer with us if you are available. Now, in this uh, session, I want to speak to you about the habits of successful prayers. And by prayer, I mean one who prays. Pray, yeah. Another word is supplicant. A supplicant is one who presents his request to God. And as you know, prayer is more than supplication. There's thanksgiving prayer. There's different kinds of, of, uh, of prayers. But I want to speak to you particularly about the habits of successful prayers. One who prays. And as you know, uh, the Bible says in Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. There are several reasons why one should pray. Prayer pleases God. The Bible tells us in Proverbs uh, 15, 8, the prayer of the upright is his delight. Prayer resists temptation. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Prayer assures one of God's presence. The Bible says in Psalms 145, verse 18, The Lord is near to all who call upon him. <coughs> Prayer is submission to God, Luke 18, 1, where Jesus spoke the parable and said, Men ought always to pray and not to lose heart. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Another reason for prayer is because prayer is effective. James 5, 16, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Prayer reveals unsearchable things. Jeremiah 33 verse 3, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. And then of course 1 Timothy 4 uh, verse 5 or rather from verse 4 it says, For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So this is a sancti there's a sanctifying power in prayer. Now in your journey you will meet people who have had no answers to prayer. Then you'll meet people who have had some answers to prayer. And the third category is a group of people who have their prayers answered frequently. And I want to deal with the third category today. And uh, not all saints are equal. We are on the journey to perfection, uh, to come to the place where Isaiah 65 verse 24 says, And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Now James 5.16, the second part of it is very, very interesting. It says, The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The emphasis there is on the quality of the man that prays. In this apostolic season, the emphasis is on equipping 
the saints. It is a migration from sending your prayer request to someone to going personally to the throne of grace to obtain mercy in time of need. There is nothing wrong with you asking other people to pray for you, but there must come a time where you have boldness and confidence to access the throne of grace and obtain answers. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now again, James 5.16 says, The earnest prayer, or the effective fervent prayer, of a righteous man has great power and wonderful results. The Living Bible. Psalms 34 verse 15 The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. Psalms 34 verse 17 The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Proverbs 10 24 The fear of the wicked will come upon him and the desire of the righteous will be granted. Proverbs 15.29 The Lord is far from the wicked, and he hears the prayer of the righteous. So the key in James 5.16 is righteousness, the quality of the person that prays. Now, Abraham was a righteous man. Romans 4.3 says, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now let us consider Abraham's intercession for Sodom. As you know, God wanted to destroy Sodom in Genesis chapter 18. Let me just read that so you can get the context in verse 16. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because the sin is very grievous. Now God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because he deemed that the sin was very grievous. In verse 21, he says, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord, and Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous men with the wicked? Now I am reading from the old King James Version uh, because it can easily be referenced to the Hebrew or in the New Testament to the Greek. Now Abraham interceded for Sodom asking God if he would destroy the righteous with the wicked. The Lord declared that he would spare the city for the sake of 50 righteous men. And then you know that Abraham whittled that figure down and he asked God, will you destroy the city for 45 righteous men or righteous people? And God said he would not <coughs> if there were 45 righteous in that city. Abraham brought the figure down to 40 then he brought it down to 30, then he brought it down to 20, then he brought it down to 10, and uh, 
and thereafter is supplication ended, his intercession ended and we know the city of Sodom was destroyed because there were, because there were not sufficient righteous people. In fact, there were only three, Lot and his two daughters. And the city was destroyed because just three of them were deemed righteous. And we know that Lot was deemed righteous and uh, his family that followed him, his, his daughters, they were saved. Now, this is very, very important because righteousness protects a city. Righteousness or righteous individuals in a city confer protection to that city. Now, God will not destroy a city if there are righteous people in the city. And we know that in the day of Abraham it came down to 10. And I want to say to you that today there are more than 10 righteous people in the city of Durban. I would go further to say that there are more than 10 righteous churches in our city. Therefore, I am positive, I am optimistic that Durban will be saved. It will be well with the Durban for generations to come. Now, I want to share with you some things that took me 38 years to learn. I want to deal with the habits of successful prayers or supplicants or intercessors. You could factor these principles into your life to ensure great success in receiving answers to prayers. So there are more than 13 classical habits of the righteous that I want to deal with. So I will not be able to complete in this session. So there will be a session 2 and possibly a session 3. The first habit is the spirit of agreement or the spirit of oneness. Let me read Matthew 18 verse 19. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So here's a very important clue to success uh, in your prayers. Pray with people that agree with the request. Now, verse 20 is connected to verse 19. The gathering must be in the name of Christ. The name of God embraces his nature, his authority, his manifest presence, his excellence. So verse 20 influences verse 19. So when you pray, don't only pray with people that agree with your request. Pray with people that are firstly in agreement with God. You are praying in the name of God or you are praying in the name of Christ when there is the spirit of agreement, when there is the character of God manifested in your life. You could be praying with people that agree with your requests but they are not in the name of Christ. The very nature of Christ, the name of Christ, embraces his character, which is righteous, which, which includes holiness, faithfulness, wisdom, truth, love, excellence, etc. The communicable attributes of God. So, 
if you are looking for people to pray with, make sure you find people who are abiding in the name of Christ. I think a lot of prayer meetings are actually very wasteful because the people who are praying are just using the name of Jesus but they are not living in the name of Christ. This is very important. This is, this is the quintessential essential demand of these two verses that I've this, just shared with you. If the person you are praying with is for instance, let me use something that is very very common during this lockdown period because I've had phone calls from pastors who have been deeply hurt by some people who have broken covenant with them during this lockdown period. Now praying with a with a hun, with the unrepentant covenant breaker is a waste of time. Just like praying with a hypocrite or praying with antichrist. You are praying with people that are not in the name of Christ. Um, you could have been in covenant with someone but you have left behind a major offense when you broke covenant. You now owe someone a debt of love. Settle that debt before coming to meet with God. Let me share the scripture with you. Matthew 5.23 Therefore if you bring your gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother had ought against thee. That means you owe your brother something. Leave there your gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to, the, to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So you can see that relationships are very important uh, when it comes to success in your prayer life. I was once at a prayer meeting this was actually a prayer concert when many years ago when God spoke to me very very clearly during that prayer meeting. There was a pastor praying on the stage and he was praying a very uh, loud prayer, very powerful, looked very powerful but God was just sharing with me how empty the prayer was because this pastor, the Lord just gave me a glimpse of how behind him was a trail of blood. He was a serial covenant breaker. In fact, he had left a very good network of pastors without telling the apostle or the bishop of that network. He just fled from that network, not explaining to the bishop, not explaining to the elders, he just left without telling them and moved on to start his own network and uh, is continuing up to today uh, without any reconciliation, without giving heed to Matthew 5.23 where you bring your gift to the altar and there you remember that someone, your brother, has something against you or rather you owe him something. We all owe others a debt of love. And so Christians or genuine sons of God are not in the habit of breaking relationships. When you break a relationship you cause a wound in the body and for the rest of your life the trail of blood will follow you until you make some kind of restitution, reconciliation, correction to remedy the relationship. It does not mean that you need to walk with that person again for the rest of your life because there are some people uh, at some stage in your life even if you were in covenant you will realize that you can no longer walk with them 
and you may need to depart from that relationship. But the way you depart is very, very important. And so this particular pastor departed from that network in a very bad way and was continuing in ministry and there he was on the stage praying. And the Lord said to me, he is not praying in the name of Christ. And therefore we have to be very careful. Strife hinders prayer. Where there is strife, there is disunity. God cannot command a blessing where brothers are not dwelling together in unity and oneness. Psalms 133, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity, for there the Lord commands the blessing, life forevermore. The 120 in the upper room embraced the culture of unity and oneness and experienced answers to prayer. Pray with people that agree with your request and are free from strife and they agree with God. Don't pray with serial covenant breakers, hypocrites, antichrists, believers, gossipers. Don't be fooled by the numbers. These prayers are not going to be answered even though you may have a large number of people gathered together to pray, particularly if those who are leading that prayer meeting are walking in strife and contention. I refer you to an Old Testament passage where Sennacherib, the Assyrian, attacked the nation of Israel, boxed Israel in, uh, and during the siege uh, there was famine, the water supply was cut off, uh, Rabshakeh was the emissary of Sennacherib, uh, undermined the leadership of Ezekiah and tried to move the people to betray Ezekiah. And Ezekiah was a righteous man. All of us know how he served God in bringing one of the finest reformations to the nation of Israel, or rather to Judah. And the Bible tells us that Ezekiah joined himself to Isaiah and prayed together. And uh, as a result of that prayer, the Assyrian attack was destroyed. In fact, God sent an angel and defeated that army. It was not everyone praying. It was just two people who were praying in agreement. So I think this is a very important for successful prayers. If you want to be a successful supplicant or intercessor, make sure you are praying with the right people. Second abbot of successful prayers is the righteous fast. Now this has nothing to do with abstention from food. As I have mentioned several times before, abstention from food without a lifestyle change is a hunger strike. Now if you look at Isaiah 58 verse 6, this is what God says. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rear ward. Now there are four main features that pres that precede answered prayer in Isaiah 58. The first principle 
is the principle of justice. God says, is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, undo the heavy burdens, let the oppressed go free and you break every yoke. That means every time you are engaged in setting other people free from oppression, whatever that oppression might be, and all of you that are listening to me or watching are acquainted with all kinds of oppression all over the world. When you take the stand of breaking that oppression, like Nelson Mandela did or Martin Luther King did and several others, several people who were directed by the word of God to take a stand for justice. Your act of justice is a declaration of a righteous fast that is decreed by God. The second feature of this fast is benevolence. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house when thou seest the naked that thou cover him and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. At verse 7 is talking about feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, providing shelter for the poor. All of these are acts of benevolence. In fact, the Bible says, those who give to the poor lend to God. And we know that God is a debtor to no one. He will always reward uh, those who engage in acts of benevolence. Let me, let me read the scripture to you. Proverbs 19.17 He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. Now what comes to mind is Acts chapter 10 verse 1 that reads there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one who feared God with his house which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the, day, of the day an angel of God coming to him and saying to him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Your prayers and arms are come up for a memorial before God. So we find that God took notice of Cornelius, a Gentile, because of his acts of benevolence. Now, let me read to you from Matthew 6 verse 2 just to get this thing right. It says here, Therefore when thou doest thine alms, that means when you are giving to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. But when thou doest arms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. God is saying that when you are taking care of the poor, do it quietly. Do it inconspicuously. Don't put it on Facebook. How you gave 20 amperes to the poor, posing with them. The reason is, we know that God is a debtor to the one who gives to the poor. God doesn't want you to show the whole world that he owes you something. Do it quietly. Don't be flamboyant and exhibitionistic like a, like a lot of non-governmental organizations I know 
constantly telling us on television, sending us messages, how many people they fed and so on and what they did and how they did it, etc., etc. In fact, the people that I know who are very, very successful uh, businessmen, uh, they are very generous people and they give a lot to the poor but no one knows that they give they do it quietly some of them send send me large amounts of of money to distribute uh, to give to the poor and they say please don't tell anyone they send us uh, all kinds of food items to distribute to the poor and they say don't put my name on it and I know that these are the Corneliuses of our day they are beyond Gentiles I know that they will have angels visiting them and I know that God will answer when they call and of course I've seen that I've seen the way the business grows I've seen the way they prosper over the last 38 years because of their generosity and concern for the poor they don't know I had to show them that they are people given to fasting this is more than the Daniel fast this is more than the Esther fast this is more than any other fast that you can think of even greater than a 40-day fast because God says is not this the fast that I have decreed so when you take care of the poor when you provide shelter for the poor when you clothe the naked uh, you are actually walking in an Isaiah 58 fast a fast decreed by God and the third part of this fast is that you will not point your finger let me read this to you verse 9 if you take away from the midst of thee the yoke the putting forth of the finger that means you stop accusing and blaming others for the problems that you are going through these are people that spend a lot of time blaming others for their problems the Bible calls that the pointing finger when you come to the place where you stop complaining about other people and stop accusing other people even when they have done you wrong and you bear it quietly waiting for God to deliver you waiting for God to answer because as you get older you'll find out that it's a waste of time to complain to other people as you get older you come to realize that you must be careful for nothing but in everything with thanksgiving to let your requests and supplications be made known unto the Lord there is a great complaining spirit in the church these people love to complain to other people and to those who are on the receiving end at some stage in your life you must know how to stop people from complaining to you and point them to the Lord so this is so important because when you stop complaining and stop pointing your finger and stop blaming other people and stop being an accuser of the brethren you have then walked into an Isaiah 58 fast the fourth part of this fast is that you stop speaking vanity vanity means emptiness it means speaking without action it means empty speaking it means speech that causes harm it means deceitful speaking could even mean lies it means unjust speaking flattery so when you put aside all those acts of vanity that comes out of our mouth 
you are declaring an Isaiah 58 fast. So, the Isaiah 58 fast, there are other things to this fast, but I've just covered four. The Isaiah 58 fast is justice. The Isaiah 58 fast is benevolence. The Isaiah 58 fast is about removing the pointing finger, stop blaming other people. And lastly, the Isaiah 58 fast is about departure from evil speaking. Listen to what happens in verse 9. God says, Then thou shalt call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. And I want to say to you, in my 38 years of experience in church life, I know people who are walking in the Isaiah 58 fast. They are very, very successful. I'm amazed when they, when, they, when they ask God for anything, they get it so easily. When they go into business, they are very, very successful. One clear feature of the righteousness is that they don't advertise and they shun the limelight in their acts of benevolence. So I have just covered two features or two habits of successful prayers. I thought I could cover more today, but in my next session, I will deal with a few more. In the meantime, please continue to pray as there are a few pastors that I know of and some of our loved ones who are now being afflicted by this COVID virus. We thank God that many of them have recovered as the church prayed. I want to thank all of you that prayed for Romel while he was in hospital. After undergoing surgery, it was touch and go. There was a time where we, we even lost hope. We thought we were going to lose him when he was on a ventilator. And uh, as the church prayed, the Lord uh, effected a wonderful work of healing and uh, you'll probably be discharged within the next two days so I want to thank all of you for agreeing with us in prayer please continue to pray it is effective it works God bless you till we meet again <music>